Um, hello, uh, it's Ron here, of course, and doing my uh, Hopi videos always. And I have Martin here with me, and uh, I'll let Martin tell you his last name. And uh, Martin contacted me, he wanted to get some information out there uh, for the Hopi people. And um, as we all know, out there is pretty much my job anymore. So we're going to let Martin start talking here, and um, he'll explain to you what we're going to do. So go ahead, Martin. Hello out there. Uh, my name is Martin. Uh, my Hopi name is Maleva. I come from the Hopi Reservation. Uh, I live down here right now with my son uh, because of the way uh, work is up there. There's not much work up there, so we have to go back and forth. Uh, so what I want to talk about basically is about myself so you um, understand who I am and where I come from and things like that. Uh, uh, so I'm going to kind of start from the beginning. Uh, I lived on the reservation when I was little, and uh, I, uh, at the age of six, uh, me and my brother were taken from our village. So for, uh, uh, until the age of 13, uh, the way we lived was uh, out of the car, actually. We uh, uh, camped in uh, major campgrounds all over, like Zion, uh, Yellowstone, and the way we made a living was uh, we would Indian dance at the park and uh, stop on the side of the road sometimes and dance like that, throw a blanket down and people would give us some money and we'd live in the car, in the campground, things like that. But in the time that we were gone, uh, we have uh, danced with almost every tribe in the United States. I've been in every state in the United States except for Hawaii and Alaska. So we have been dancing with many, many tribes, learned a lot about their history and their ceremonies also too. So when uh, I finally did come back home, I was uh, 16 years old, I didn't even know who my mother was. Uh, I got off the bus here in Phoenix and uh, there was a lady there left and she walked up to me and said, uh, are you my son, Dean, is what she called me. And I had to ask her if she was my mother. <laughs> that's kind of sad, but that's what happened. So I stayed down here for a little while, but uh, there was a point where I was uh, raised out there. I didn't really go to school whatsoever. Our education was um, what I could read. And I didn't read for a long time or anything like that because I didn't go to school because we would go from one city, one town to the next. Sometimes we'd be there two or three days. Sometimes we'd be there a month because uh, they were looking for us. You know, back then there was no internet and all that. So the way they tried to find us was through newspapers and things like that, but uh, we actually started out working in uh, Old Tucson. Uh, when I was a little boy, we Indian danced there, and uh, I was going to show you some photographs I will here in a minute when I was little, and uh, from there we just traveled all over the place, and uh, like I say, when I was 16, I didn't really figure out where, my, where I belonged, so I wanted to go to Vietnam, so I asked my mother at the age of 17 to sign for me. Uh, she kind of refused because she said I was going to be signing my death certificate, but I told her how I felt, so she did sign. So I did my three years in the United States Army. I was at Fort Ward in California and Fort Carson, Colorado. When I got done with my tour, I came back home here. I couldn't get a job. Nobody would give me a job. In those days, if you did something they didn't like, well, they weren't going to give you work. So I drove a tractor in the field. I worked in the field eating dust. And I said to myself, there's got to be more to this than doing this. I, I just couldn't get a job, no worries. So I decided I got to find something. So I uh, started working in the mobile homes. And uh, I learned everything in the mobile home remodeling and all this. And then I would quit, even though the pay was good, I would go to the next. So I would learn, then I learned the general uh, rules about everything and how to do contracting. So it was like Ron and myself, we both contractors. I've been doing it for 35 years, uh, general remodeling and everything. And then my son took over it. And I decided to go ahead and go back into my artwork. I went back into my artwork that I've been carving with my father for um, 30, well, all my life actually. And we basically started out with uh, these type of dolls here, which before they started, uh, the youngsters started making traditional dolls, which are 
the not like these dolls, but more like these dolls. We were making these way before anybody ever did. So this is the type of dolls that I am used to making these type here. Which uh, actually I'm uh, working on one right now, which is this one here. But anyway, in the meantime too, I uh, make these other type of dolls here, you know. Some of these are pretty old. This one here I put in the state fair in the 1980s and won a couple of ribbons and things like that. But that's part of uh, my life. I kind of raised myself. Uh, me and my brother Ernest, we uh, lived in a car. We lived in a Volkswagen. It's pretty hard to live in a Volkswagen. We just sleep in there and uh, when we were in Yellowstone, you'd heat up water, wash your face. and It was pretty rough. but. Uh, um, I would never change it for anything in the world because I have seen so much and been in so many places uh, that uh, a lot of people would love to go and see. And so I would never trade that uh, for anything. So what uh, I and Ron uh, hopefully are going to be doing is working together on uh, I want to try to explain things to you uh, a lot about things and hopefully uh, you will understand what I'm trying to get out there to people and uh, I'd love for you to join us with all these things we're going to be uh, doing. And uh, I met Ron uh, a few years back at the Herd Museum Carver Show and uh, basically I was putting back and forth if I should do this type of thing or not but I'm getting at that age that I want my people, the Hopi people from all my villages, the youngsters to hopefully see uh, the big changes from when we were young to where we are now and the older folks also. I, uh, I am from the Reed clan. Uh, I do come from First Mesa. Uh, my family lives up there and we also have a home in uh, Walby. And I have this home here because like I say there's no work. So what I would like to talk about is there's so many things we got going but I, I uh, basically want to tell uh, things about not just the Hopis but about the Zunis and about the Apaches and the Pimas, the Papagos, uh, Cheyennes, uh, uh, Crows, uh, so many different tribes that we've danced with and at the same time I want to show you things that I've collected over over 50 years. Uh, things that you won't see in museums uh, because they're just not there anymore. So and then from there I want to try to take you and explain to you what the Kachina means to everybody. Uh, it isn't just for the Hopi people, it actually is supposed to be for the whole world. But things have changed so much and uh, that anymore it's pretty hard to see the dance anymore. And I want to tell you the reason why this happened. And this happened because there was a point in time where everybody was uh, welcome to see our Kachina dances until Marvel Comics came up to our reservation and they were told not to take pictures, they were told not to take drawings. They made a comic book that actually ruined everything for everybody and... Uh, that was Mad Magazine, wasn't it? No, this is the comic book. Oh, that was... okay. I, my uncle is Kachina chief up there, so he's the one who handled this. There was actually six copies of this left. I owned all six of the copies. These are number one through six. Um, I have given uh, to my son and one friend of mine, one of each of this copy, which they framed and put away. But we're going to talk about this book because inside this book, it's not very good at all. It's uh, chopping heads or things like that. But they are the ones who ruin the opportunity for others to see this dance. So, some places it's coming back where you're welcome, some places it's not. So this is one thing that I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you also about in 1975 up to 1989 when I did work in the mobile home industry they built a community and I tried to stop them from building this community, two communities. So we're going to go out there, one community is gone, it's completely flattened out, there's still one there barely hanging on. But what they did was they built this community on top of native grounds passing through as the Hopis and Navajos and the Sazis had this place as they were traveling migrating up north. So 
I've known about this place since then. I've been there many times. I leave my offerings. I go to see my ancestors. But some place there, when my ancestors, my grandfather told me there was two kivas there, that I need to find these kivas. So I've been back. I look at terrain. So what uh, I mean, what I'm going to try to attempt to do is go back there and see what where it's at before it's completely destroyed. It's uh, it's quite big. It might be four, four to five hundred acres. Every place you go, you dig down, not even that far, six to eight inches to a feet. Uh, there's pottery and this is all types of things there that need to be uh, preserved somehow, some way. So we want to take you there and we want you to join us on this so we can see what we can try to do to save for our people. This is for all of the people migrating up north. That's another thing that we want to do. Also, there was a man in 1920s that lived on the Hopi Reservation. He was a white man. Uh, his name was po Potu. He was a sculptor there. He lived right below down in the Mesa and he sculptured the Native American people the way they were in the 1920s. Well, he sculptured my grandfather. So I have this picture of this uh, sculpture that he had, that he made. But at the same time, when Goldwater was going up to the reservation, he commissioned him to make a fountain. The fountain was supposed to go to the town of Flagstaff. Well, he finished the fountain up in the 1940s. He gave it to the town of Flagstaff. They stored it away in a warehouse, and they couldn't find it. It disappeared. They found it again 10 years later. So they took it, they stored it away, and they lost it again forever. So what it is, uh, I found an old magazine, and I'm going to show you two highway magazines of this fountain that they can't find. It's called the Lost Fountain. And it's got cuchillas all the way around it, and it had uh, sculptures on it. Well, I found out where the sculptures at. This fountain is at. It's been here all the time. It's in an ASU but it's all covered up with moss and all that and the water's still running out so I'd like me and Juan to go down there and find this sculpture so we can show it to you that it actually was never lost it was more or less misplaced so that's another thing I'd like to uh, discuss with you and also show you so many different things I want to and I'm kind of jumping around but I want to show you uh, weapons different types of weapons that that different tribes used with when they had their wars. This one here is actually a pretty vicious weapon. These are uh, uh, deer horns and they were so unique because the ends were shaven down to when it hit a person you tilted sideways and it would stay inside your body. So this is basically what it is. At the end of it it also has a big rock to defend themselves and they would hold it a different thing. And this one here, it's also another. This is more or less from the Sioux clan. We the horn here to, to dig in, and also at the end, when they would have uh, metal, when they would get it from the soldiers and stuff, they would say part of it. And this is from their snake or serpent clan of the warriors. So this is also, this is what uh, you call a close hand to hand combat uh, weapon that they use. The Sioux women, they would carry like this type of knife. This is a Sioux. This is a star Sioux of the Sioux Indians. The women would carry this on their back. So if they ever get attacked, they had uh, a weapon to use, so they would carry this. And I have so many other different types of weapons. So that's another thing that I would like to talk to you about, to other tribes and their way of survival uh, through battles. Um, this here is a, this here is a, a breastplate from the Cheyennes. So, this is very, very old. The, uh, before they went out to battle, like, uh, uh, you know, Bighorn Custer, this is the type that they would put on as they would go out to battle. Uh, I've had this for oh, probably around 50 years or more. And uh, I have quite a bit of different ones. So this is from the Cheyenne Indians here. Or it could be used by the Sioux, but the, basically the Cheyennes. And uh, that's other things that we're going to go and show you about. 
and also, um, I don't know if Ron can tilt it this way, but these are, I'll bring it down. Yeah, you better bring it down. I can't. Yeah, I'll just bring it down. Okay. okay. Let's see if I can get this down. Let's try and see. You got it? Here, let me help you. Okay, you got it? Okay. Okay. This here, this one here is the one that are given to the children when they could units come. They would get, uh, the children would get rattles or they would get bows. But this is a, a one that was given to me when I was a little boy. That tells you how old it is. And they're made different now than they were back then. Uh, they were made better back then than they are. You could actually really hunt rabbits with these. The ones now are a little bit different. But this is mine and I have several of them that were given to me from Katinas. Now this one here is a real bow and arrow. This one here is the Hopi warrior. Uh, when we used to hunt uh, rabbits and when we had deer and when we had uh, things to feed ourselves. These are the type of weapons we would use and I want to show you how to actually make one out of the real materials and this is made out of sinew and I just don't have it bent and the real arrows and then I have quite a bit of other things that I want to show you weapon wise but that will be one of the things we'll be talking about in the future to come. So that's what I want to talk about when we get, that, get to that point. Um, also, something very, very important I uh, want to show you. Inside of this envelope, and we won't open it now. Me and Ron are going to open this when we're ready. In this side, this was made in the 1940s, or maybe even earlier than that. This is what they call uh, the elders, nine elders from nine kivas. This is the nine kivas that we have on Hopi. Inside of this were predictions of things to come, things that have already happened. Uh, as the elders were talking, uh, my father and, and my uncles were writing this down. From Hopi to English, it changes a lot. So as this was going on, it's written in three or four different ways. One is the original, which I have in here, one is part in Hopi, and the other one is interpreted to another one. Now, once this was done, it was taken to the Denver, Denver uh, National uh, for the History of Native American People, where at that time it was printed in what looked like rice paper, the meanings of everything. And then to make sure it was real, uh, each one of the elders put a piece of their hair in there and also um, they stamped it somehow inside of each one of these papers with the seal from there and it tells a lot about um, where we came from, uh, what was going to happen to us in the future, what has already happened to us now, uh, what they say will happen to our children, uh, how we're going to end up not being here anymore if we're not watching what we're doing. There's a very, very important things in here that need to be discussed. Uh, at this time we won't open it, but this is something that we need to sit down, I and Ron, and kind of go through so we can get this together for you. So you will see, nobody has ever seen this before. The people that wrote this are no longer here. The people who typed this out are no longer here. It was sent back to my father in 1992 through the Herd Museum. And then the Herd Museum, Byron, that was running the Herd Museum, gave it back to my father without it being opened up. And you can see the stamps are back from them. The seal is from Denver, Colorado. So this has been returned back to me to save, to get out to the people so they can see it. It will change a lot of what the people have been saying because of the way it came out and the way that elders told the stories and what they're going to tell. So this is one thing too I want, I want to talk about. I also want to talk about something really important that uh, I want to talk about building Hoover Dam. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, Hoover Dam. Well, my father worked there at the dam and I have the old pictures of the Native Americans working in Hoover Dam, which is actually really wonderful. Uh, the way that they were treated as they were working on building this dam. I have all the old pictures of them. 
uh, crossing the line, just barely hanging on with strings, and they would do all the horrible jobs, the dynamite blowing up, and I have all of those. They're all in here, which I want to show you too, but we can't get to it right now. And also, a lot of these, as we go along, uh, I want to show you the ones that, uh, when we did uh, powwows all over the country, we were actually very fortunate that we had an uh, old uh, Polaroid, old Polaroid camera that you put the tape in there and you pull the right. And a lot of these are, I don't know if you can see them, but these are a lot of the places that we've been to and all, a lot of all of the tribes, um, all of the tribes that we've been dancing with. I was trying to get these together for you on but Anyway, we're going to go to some of these and uh, show you all the different tribes and I'll tell you uh, a lot about these tribes and how they do things and uh, some of their dances that they perform and uh, we've been to a lot of them that right now no longer exist. They're uh, gone forever. But like I say, we'll go to that. That's something else that I want to get by with. I want to also show you, when we get to a point, I want to talk about the Seminole Indians. <laughs> when we were down in uh, Florida, we lived in a place called Offspring, and we lived in Sarasota. Well, in Venice, it is the home of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. So we used to Indian dance here. But for some reason, my father, I didn't even know this even existed, but this is back from way back when. This is the book of the Ring and Buzz and Barn Baby Circus where we, we were where we were Indian dance with them but this I'm glad he saved this. But I want to talk about I want to talk about the Seminole Indians and uh, uh, when we travel the country as we travel the country different places uh, Native Americans didn't travel the country that often. So, being an Indian had its good things and it had its bad things. Trying to go to school was not a good thing because we were made fun of quite often. So, there was a lot of hard times there, but at the same time, people didn't know what Hopis were. But when we danced with the Seminole Indians and they used to alligator, fight with alligators and all that, we worked here at Ringling Brothers also. And I have a lot of photographs I want to go through that and talk about the Seminoles. And, their beautiful artwork that they do, a lot of their weavings and stuff that they do. Uh, as we're going that way, we'll head up towards uh, uh, different countries. Up to we get up to New York with um, the Mohawk Indians and the Wanna Say Indians. We've danced with them before, and uh, I have a lot of photographs. I want to talk about that. But they're different tribes and what they do. And uh, so you see, there's going a lot of things uh, that I would like to talk about. I want to talk about this also. This book was made for the Hopi children in 1942. It was made uh, for the Hopi kids that didn't speak English. It's a pretty kind of rare book because it's about the field mouse that goes to war. And what it is here is the reason why they actually, the missionaries wanted to stop this book because the reasoning, the story was told in English. On this side it was told in Hopi. So you have English part and the Hopi part. This is an original book, it's not a recopy. And it shows the stories and they like it because it talked about smoking, the, you know, in the ceremonies. But the main reason is they wanted not the children to um, learned their culture. They wanted to English, so they banned the book. And so it was, it was remade again in English, and only in English, not in Hopi and English. So I want to talk about this book. This book actually comes from Second Mesa, the story itself. As you're going up to Second Mesa, there's a big rock on the side, and that's where this, this mouse, the warrior mouse, killed the chicken hawk that was killing the animals. So it's a wonderful story and you can see that the little mouse is dancing here in the plaza as the people are laughing at him because they didn't think he was brave enough to kill this chicken hawk when no other warrior could get rid of this chicken hawk. It's an absolutely wonderful story. So uh, a few years back 
uh, there's a place called um, Giant's Chair. Uh, Ron has gone there. They call it different names. He was there with a gentleman called Akeem, and they called it the President's Chair. Well, each village has a different name for it. Uh, we call it the Giant's Chair because that is where the Hopi's, uh, uh, the Hopi boy killed the giant that was killing uh, our people and our livestock. So, can I say something now? Absolutely. Now, when you this is very important. You just said giants. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of Native American tribes, Paiutes up north in Utah and all that, all have stories of the giants. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling me the Hopis have a story of a giant. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and that's why I want to hear. I've never, I, this is very important to mm -hmm. me. That's why I want, okay. Yeah. That's why I'm repeating this. Right. Okay. Absolutely. That, that's very important. Um, right. So, but when we, uh, they say a lot of us came from down in Grand Canyon. If you go down in Grand Canyon by uh, uh, half a soup by down there. Uh, there's pitticles with giants and there's big giant uh, 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 elephants with all the hair and then you'll see these big giants there and these little people and these big giants are, are standing with these pitchogriffs. So there have been giants all over. I made a card here one time that actually was sold, uh, it was sold last year, it was bidded out by three museums. One was the herd and the other museum was the Museum of uh, uh, New Mexico, and the other one was the Museum of Texas. Well, actually what it was was a whole village. And uh, I put a giant in there, and the giant was used to lift up these giant rocks that built our village. So I have this big giant holding these big rocks, setting them on top, which would be actually uh, my village and Second Mesa. And it shows that. So. That's why they bid it out on this, because nobody's ever made that before. So the reason why I brought this up is, I also... You know, there, there, there's a rock on O'Reilly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? The yeah. square rock with the I, hole? Is that I what... Did. Oh, okay. And, and that's in one of my videos, too. Because I, I, uh, I had the kids playing by it, because right. that was where Patrick lived. Yeah. My old buddy Patrick Lancel lived. Okay. Right, I saw that. that same st is that the stone you're talking about? Mm. That type of work, or not? No. Okay. So okay. But All I know right. what you're, you're saying. So one day I was sitting here and I, I was told a story when I was a little boy. And I said, you know what? If I don't tell this story, and it's going to be lost forever, like these other books are. So I sat down one day and I started out with little simple things. So I had these little cards my wife made. So I started telling the story. So it started out like that, and then it went to these little pictures here and the story I wrote on the, the giant. And the reason why I'm not showing this real good to you because I want you, we're going to come back to all this and about the giant. So then from there it went to this which is the giant and the mud head. The giant and the mud head and the Hopi boy. So what it is is then you get into this part here where the, it was made this way. And you'll see that the whole story goes there. I drew all the drawings on here that, that I made as we were going along. I sat in here and did it, every bit of it. And then after that, it kind of turned into this. And then, so then I got a publisher. The publisher was going to publish my book. So I was happy that it was going to be published now. Okay. So this, so the publisher said, okay, we're going to publish a book. We love this book. So then uh, the book got sent to an editor. And this is the actual editor's version of my book. So if you take my original book and go through what the editor went through, which this is the editor's part of the book, and it just goes on about my story, they chopped it to pieces. They took a lot of stuff out of it because they say, well, this is a different time. Uh, you can't say that anymore. I said, but when this story came out, it wasn't a different time. This story needs to be told the way that my grandfather told it, not the way that you want me to tell this story to people. So I, uh, we went back and forth about the book being published. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want you to publish the book. So don't publish the book. So we decided not to, but I'm going to put the book out myself, even if I have to make one copy at a time, and if you want to buy it, that's fine. So what I did there, was I made this, if you look at this, is the front cover of this. Just I carved this. That's that and that is this. 
That is the front, this is the front cover of my book. So I actually made the garden. So I made it what I thought would be good for the kids to see. I didn't put a lot of detail into it, I just made a giant. So the giant's there, and down here if you see the little village, he smashed all the little village down our little houses. And on the back, back here, he's stealing our cows. He's taking our cows with his big axe and his knife. And here is how the Hopi boy and the warrior Mudhead killed him. But I'm not going to tell you how because we're going to come back to that. It's in the story. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. So I did, did make the copy with the book. So I, that's one thing I want to talk to you folks about that. So we'll get back to that. And very important about this book and how we... Retreat. Also, I want to talk about going to day, uh, day, to, um, day school and boarding school, how we were treated. Yeah, it's very important. Very, very, important. very, very, very important. So I want to talk to you about that and how also the, all Native Americans were treated and how I was treated as a youngster at uh, boarding school and day school. And then we're going to talk about this little mudhead here. Seems like it's just a regular mudhead, but it's not. I made this because of the way the missionaries came to our village and said that our casinos were disgraceful because they didn't wear clothes. Well, they never wore clothes. So that's why to this day uh, the casinos wear a breech cloth at, because of the missionaries. So that is a wonderful and that's a true story of what, how they changed the Hopis and what happened. So that's the story that we will talk about. All these stories are pretty much quite long, so um, that's why we have to keep coming back and forth to different things. I want to talk to you about the star people. Uh, people call them aliens, um, UFOs. I want to show you photographs that I've been taking in uh, 1969 of a, a bunch of um, star people that came to our village uh, on a day that we had a ceremony. And there was a lot of pictures taken a day. I took probably 20 pictures. I, I want to show you those photographs uh, and also I wish the other people would show theirs also but the ones that I have are absolutely spectacular and we'll show those and we'll talk about those. Um, okay so anyway we got a lot of things I want to talk uh, really quick too also about the Spaniards. I want to talk about uh, the Yaqui Indians and how the Spaniards wanted to demolish them. In this box I have here I have these like voodoo that they made to get rid of the Spaniards. I have those here, original ones. So as we go along, we'd really like it. We'd really love for, for you to join myself, my love, and Ron on these little things that we're trying to get out to people. So hopefully uh, you'll take the time to uh, come to this channel and do this. And I just want to thank Ron for uh, giving me this opportunity to work with him. So I will say God bless to all of you and be safe. My name is Malev. And, and I want to thank you very much for allowing me to do this. And uh, as my friend Martin says, we'll make a series of these videos and we'll go around and even up. Martin's going to do a show up on the Petrified Forest. We'll probably run up and take a shot of that at him and stuff. So, so I like to say, God bless and enjoy Hopi history as it should be told. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.